We actually haven't heard a lot of Huxley quotes in this conference, which is a bit surprising, so I'm going to start with one. There are things known and there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. And I would likely like you to hold this in mind, because this is the basic idea of the predictive processing framework. Uh, maybe can I have a show of hands just so I know who I'm talking to? How many of you have heard of the predictive processing framework? Predictive coding framework? Okay, so I'm gonna try to cater to everyone. Um, and I had to keep a lot of things out of the slides because of time, so please feel free to ask me things at the end, ask for the full manuscript, and et cetera. Um, so this was the motivation why I'm doing this work, but I think you're pretty much convinced that psychedelic research is important, so I can just move on. Well, where do these ideas from the predictive processing framework come from? They come from ideas from statistical physics as applied to biological systems. What do I mean by that? I mean that a biological organism, in order to stay alive, has to separate itself from the environment. A biological organism has to put a limit on the amounts of states it can be in, otherwise it will literally find itself in a state of mess and turn into a pile of mud, which as we all know, eventually we will become. But how can the brain actually help us um, postpone this state of turning into a pile of mud? Well, the brain doesn't actually have access to the outside world, does it? The brain only has access to its sensory inputs. But by looking at these statistical regularities that are coming from its sensory inputs, the brain can start creating this model of what is causing its sensory inputs, and that way understand the environment as well as what its own organism is. Um, the brain can then use this model uh, to try to predict its own sensory inputs and in that way maintain states that are optimal for it and not find itself in dangerous states. Um, a little bit more about how the brain does that. Well, uh, and this is where Huxley's really genius, in my opinion, comes into play. The brain is thought to combine two streams of information. One of them are the predictions, things that the brain has already learned and knows. And the other stream of information is sensory input that is happening right now at this moment, things that the brain hasn't yet predicted. Um, and the brain is thought to combine these streams by using Bayesian statistics or some approximation of that. The brain is also thought to do this in a hierarchical organization. So predictions are coming from higher places in our brain's hierarchy down towards areas that have to do with the direct sensory processing, while um, sensory information is coming from lower areas into higher areas. Now this framework claims that only information that hasn't been predicted will actually start floating up to the higher levels. So whatever is predicted is actually sort of turned off by the brain. Uh, and I'm gonna give you an example that will hopefully help you understand that. And for that, I'm gonna try to get you to imagine your brain to be one of those old asteroid Atari games. Uh, your predictions are lasers, while the sensory information, am I like, hiding it, is, um, the asteroids. So what actually happens in your brain? We get a bunch of asteroids and a laser shooting them down. Okay, so this is sort of how I want you to think of your brain as we continue. Um, we're going back to psychedelics because this is, I'm trying to use this framework to explain the psychedelic phenomena. We know that 5-HT2A receptors are the ones responsible for this psychedelic phenomena. Usually these receptors are just triggered by serotonin, but lucky for us, a bunch of other substances can do that too. Uh, what happens when they get triggered? They make the neuron more likely to fire. So now let's take a look about where these receptors are. Well, interestingly enough, serotonin receptors are everywhere in our body. They're in our stomach, they're in our liver. They're also everywhere in our brain. This model focused specifically on the neocortex, the most advanced evolutionary part of our brain. 
And if we have time at the end, I'll go into why, but if not, uh, ask me and why I think this is still a very valid model. Um, there are different strengths of bind bindings. There's different amounts of receptors in your brain. And it's really quite hard to quantify still, but as far as the research I've, I've done with literary reviews, it seems that there's higher percentages of these receptors in frontal areas, as well as the visual cortex, and probably less of them in the motor cortex. And we'll see how that applies to the psychedelic um, phenomena. Where exactly are they? And this is where this starts getting interesting. They are, there's a, a bunch of these receptors that are in layer five in um, your cortex. So the cortex has five different, uh, six different layers, sorry. And there's pyramid cells in layer five that have a bunch of these receptors. Why do I care about this so much? Well, because when we go back to the predictive processing framework, the way it is thought to be implemented in the brain when we look at the actual neurons is through this nice little schematic. Um, what this schematic says is that the backwards connections, the ones in green, are the ones that, well, according to the predictive coding uh, framework, are the ones sending predictions. And this is sort of uh, quite an important uh, distinction to make. While we do know the directions in which these uh, signals are being sent. What is actually being sent, what these signals represent, is still a theory and not everyone in the neuroscience community agrees with that. But if we do, and I think there's a lot of evidence that we should um, consider this seriously, these population of neurons are the ones that are responsible for the predictive mechanisms. So now we're saying that these uh, neurons are actually getting hyperactivated because we're triggering the receptors uh, with some type of psychedelic substance. So what would that mean? Um, it would mean that instead of this regular um, predictive mechanism, um, we're now diffusing these predictions. Instead of getting one, uh, one or two strong competing predictions, we're now getting a bunch of them. Uh, predictions that were sub-thresholds are now being activated. The best thing to do is to give you an example because this is actually a really, really simple idea. So let's say there's a person working in the forest. He might predict to see, yeah, maybe there's 40% chance I'm gonna see some animals. Maybe there's 60% chance I'm gonna see some plants. If we look back again to information theory and entropy, if you like complicated words, but this just means the amount of possible states a system can be in, we're gonna get a relatively low amount of entropy. There's just a few states um, this brain is sort of competing to be in. Now let's say you took some, uh, or this person took some magic mushrooms, and he's going in the forest a bit trippy, what might he be predicting? Well, his predictive mechanisms, according to this model, are gonna get diffused, which means he might be thinking, oh, I might see birds, I might see dogs, butterflies. Uh, yeah, maybe there's even an elf, because we all were told stories about elves being uh, living in forests, and a bunch of other predictions. This is actually a much more uh, higher entropic state for the brain to be in, and I'm gonna give you another example uh, to compare this to the sort of normal state. So beforehand we saw this wide laser shooting down our predictions. Now this laser is sort of getting diffused, in which case you will only get um, um, a sort of, yeah, narrower uh, prediction, which will just turn off less of the upcoming information. So we will get a higher prediction error state in the brain. Um, a little bit of evidence that this really fits a lot of the experiments that we've been talking about in the past few days. So I won't go through all of them because there's a lot. And once you start thinking in this framework, just looking at experiments that have been presented here, they really seem to fit into this notion of a diffused set of predictions being activated because of psychedelics. So this is an MEG study, and what they found, like a lot of other studies, is disincronation uh, of the oscillations, especially you can see this in the alpha and beta 
bands. Uh, and what this means is, what are these oscillations, for those of you who aren't neuroscientists? It basically means that these neuronal groups are acting together, oscillating together. Um, this is the only thing MEG can actually measure. It's measuring pyramid cells, which for us is very good because in a lot of other experiments, MEG actually isn't very useful but it's measuring the togetherness of the oscillations. And the reduction of that means that these populations are breaking up and sort of acting separately. Um, another experiment, and this is from um, um, Robin's uh, quite, I think he's presented a lot of this, uh, um, previous experiment, uh, where they see within networks of their brain that there is a, a larger variance of behavior, of activity. And this also fits this idea of, as they also claim, the entropic brain, that there is an enhanced repertoire of possible states. And I really consider this model to be an extension uh, of this work and more of a formalization of it. Uh, so there's a bunch of other experiments that this fits, but we have no time for that. So. For now, these are the things I want you to keep in mind. There's a higher state, uh, entropic state, in the brain areas because of these hyperactivation of the receptors. This increases the lower er uh, uh, area's prediction error because whatever prediction is still chosen will not fit as much of the incoming data. And these extra predictions, this is sort of uh, an interesting thing to think about. Where are they coming from? Well, they're most likely coming from a person's individual history. What was that person like maybe more as, as a child or um, a sort of previous state before his predictions became more bored and, and his categories became more established? Um, but this is this part of the story. We all know sort of the phrase set and setting. Um, and we have been talking about set mindset, the predictions, the things that are known, but we always have this other side, the setting, what is coming from the environment. And this is really an important part of this model and of the psychedelic experience. Because if you get really precise bottom-up data, and we can remember the example of the asteroid, if you only get this little fragile asteroid floating out somewhere in the background, these diffuse predictions might actually be better at predicting that asteroid. Beforehand, he might have, your brain might ha not have even sort of connected with that uh, asteroid. And this can explain this idea that uh, is known within psychedelics that sometimes you get extremely detailed perception, an amount of clarity, which again, Huxley puts really beautifully when he describes these uh, flowers, that they were so passionately alive that they seem to be standing on the very brink of utterness. But um, the environment usually doesn't really provide us with that amount of clarity for long. Things are constantly changing. The environment is, is a noisy environment that we live in. And the less precise these bottom-up signal, signals are, the amount of predictions actually becomes more important within this computation. Um, and you can see this also not in the psychedelic phenomena. For instance, there's a syndrome called Charles Burnett syndrome where people start to get blind from their retina, it sort of start, stops working, and they start getting hallucinations. They start seeing faces and shapes because these predictive mechanisms are enforcing their predictions on noisy data. And it's sort of interesting to play with this, um, I just um, in ex maybe in experimental settings or whatever, to play with the amount of lighting you expose subjects to and sort of see how that affects their hallucinations. Because um, according to a lot of user reports, being in more dark places gives them really stronger hallucinations. Um, so yeah, under these, these sort of diffuse predictions, when the precision of sensory data isn't so good, you could actually get a misclassification and the best prediction for this weird tree might actually be an elf. And this is sort of the explanation of hallucinations. Um, this is where, I'm sorry, no codex, I'm gonna have to, I'll tab you to a video because I want you to get this idea of what might happen to your brain when this prediction error gets really high. Vessel in range, yeah, okay. lock on. <laughs> Bastard's not even changing course. So he's totally smug. I can't yeah, prediction error, right? He did on
Target the Weavers. Target the Weavers. Target everyone. Somebody fire! So this is what m might be happening to your brain and psychedelics, um, which might cause your brain to upregulate other systems that it usually uses. Your brain is constantly trying to minimize prediction error. And like we know, biological systems, when something goes wrong, other systems tend to compensate. For, OK, yeah. Um, so we're going to see how many of these mechanisms I can go through in uh, five minutes. Um, but they really, uh, uh, each of these upregulation of these systems can explain a psychedelic phenomena. So the first one is just upregulating, um, change, updating your prediction distribution. So your brain will set, you know, one type of prediction, send out, see what happens. Well, that's still bringing me really high prediction error. Let's try something else. Let's try something else. And what that will cause is a sort of disturbance in your perception. There's a video here, but we'll skip it. I think um, most of you have n know or have heard of how perception is destabilized. Your brain might be saying, oh, maybe I'm seeing something from this angle. Maybe that object is this size. Maybe it's smaller. Maybe I'm closer. And that way, your perception really gets destabilized. Uh, another thing your brain can do, it can start sort of upregulating predictions from uh, other parts uh, of your brain. And here, the best example is actually the Google Deep Dream um, ne network. And I, for those of you who haven't heard of it, Deep Dream is uh, a computerized neural network that was made to identify images. And what Google did was they looked at different layers in that network and they told those layers, do what you do, but do it more. Whatever you're predicting, over predict. And what they get is really psychedelic pictures, as you can see. And they can do this on any layer of this hierarchical system. They can go to this lower level line system and just um, yeah, tell the lines to be overly active or to higher abstract places. And this can really explain the variety of hallucinations or perceptions that we see. Sometimes uh, there's also a really brilliant paper about how these geometrical um, hallucinations are because of V1, the visual area of their brain's uh, predictions. Um, so another thing your brain can do is take that even further and really use other modalities in your brain to explain the incoming data. And this is the explanation for synesthesia, in my opinion. If your brain, which is now in a really high prediction error state, starts taking predictions from the visual system to explain sound, you're going to get synesthesia. And you can get that in various different modalities. And we've seen this image uh, many times uh, uh, in this uh, week, where you do see this added functional connectivity. And I think this is because of this upregulating mechanism to deal with prediction error. Um, so you could also act on the environment. This is a very well known um, in the literature way to minimize prediction error by actually moving, changing your body. You set parameters of your model. You make the world more predictable. Um, and the reason this probably is still a mechanism that seems to work quite well is because what I mentioned before, that it seems that the motor cortex, which is the red uh, line and your cerebellum, which is the blue line, um, parts of your brain that have to do with movement have a lot less 5-HT2A receptors. Um, and this can be really useful for, I think, harm reduction. Um, if somebody's having a bad trip or something like that, getting them to move their body will reduce um, symptoms and reduce hallucinations and reduce prediction error. Um, finally, you could, the brain, well, the could also update its model. And when we talk about the model, we're talking about long-term changes in connectivity. Um, so it's quite hard to, um, to find these things in humans still. These things are starting to be researched more. You do find uh, learning um, in rabbits improves. Uh, and for me, this is sort of, we've been seeing such amazing results with depression and OCD treatment. And for me, this is sort of the explanation why this happens. Under, when you diffuse um, your predictions, and within the predictive framework, um, there is a sort of idea of what depression is, which is more of a 
um, overly stable state where your predictions are too narrow. So your brain sort of gets stuck in believing these really bad things about itself or about the environment and cannot update its model according to whatever is really going on. So by diffusing these predictions, which these, these substances do, your brain can now update its model and has to update its model because of this higher prediction error state. Um, we do see this also in the state and the trait of openness, which seems to last for very long. Um, and we can go over that later if you want exactly what I think is happening in openness. Finally, what your brain could do, it could change the weight of the precision of the actual prediction error. So your brain could sort of learn, well, yeah, this state, I'm just tripping and whatever's happening here isn't really that important and that crazy, and I think this can be the explanation of a tolerance phenomena that psychonauts do have, uh, because chemically, you shouldn't. I mean, um, um, these substances, after a few days, are not uh, leaving any lasting effect on your brain, but any um, experienced psychedelic person will tell you that the first trips are not like the hundredth trip. Uh, we will tell you that they do need higher tolerance. And this might be because your brain just learns to go into the actual prediction error and change that, which might happen by modulating things in the dopamine system. Um, Okay, this is quite important, especially because I'm looking for a brilliant PhD student to test um, my model's prediction. Um, there's a lot of evidence regarding oscillations um, that uh, the alpha and beta oscillations are connected to top-down predictions, while the bottom-up um, information is connected to the faster waves. So I'm claiming that because of these changes that are happening, we will see changes in this, these measurements, specifically grandeur causality, which I don't have time to get into right now, but th this model does offer a very specific prediction that could and I think should be tested. Um, okay, so to sum this all up, what I want you to get from this is that uh, this model says that this whole psychedelic phenomena is sort of a three-step uh, thing. First, predictions get diffused. Then you get higher prediction error. Then your brain upregulates regular mechanisms that it usually uses. And this sort of three, uh, these three things really explain a whole lot of psychedelic phenomena. Um, we can see intersubject variation, why you get different phenomena with different people. Um, and the dependence on bottom-up data. Um, and finally, I would like to sort of leave you with uh, a little bit what I think this model also says about brains or the serotonin syndrome in general. And I do know this is quite speculative, uh, but I still would like to put it out there. So we know that the dopamine system uh, within the predictive framework isn't actually considered to be a reward signal. I've heard this uh, a lot in the past few days, but the predictive processing framework looks at dopamine as the precision of prediction error. It's sort of how your brain knows whether to trust incoming information or not, and what to do with that incoming information. Um, so I'm sort of suggesting that perhaps the serotonin system has something to do with uh, the architecture of uh, your predictive mechanisms. And it's really interesting what serotonin does in plants is actually it regulates the root system. It decides how the roots will be diffused more or less. And it's sort of really interesting, plants don't really have brains or spirits, um, but they do have predictive mechanisms and it might be really interesting to think in that direction about the serotonin system. So these, wait, these are all the things I have not had time to talk to you about, but I'm going to leave it on the board. And if you want, you can ask questions or talk to me about this later. Thank you. One question. Time for one question. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your beautiful talk. It was actually quite inspiring. Um, I wonder whether you could comment on how this predictive uh, coding, um, let's say, framework could go together with um, a criticality framework because somehow they're related. And uh, to make it very, very simple, the criticality framework is what is um, suggested from the ent entropic framework, but it 
puts a bit of a accent on the fact that the intermediate states between stability and instability <coughs> possess possesses um, more uh, dynamical complexity. And I wonder whether you could comment on the relationship between prediction error and um, predictive coding with this other framework, because I see many um, resonances. Okay, so I think what, what I find really unique about the predictive processing framework is that you always are talking about this feedback loop with the environment. And when you're talking about this criticality, this sort of cutoff, I would say, well, you should think about in what environment. Environments are very changing. You could be extremely stable and functional in one environment, but that won't translate in a different environment. Um, so that's what I can give you on that, but not much more. Okay, that's it. I want to apologize again if the technical problems took away from your coffee break. And uh, thank you, Sarit.